Amen. Okay, so today um, I've prepared some material I want to share with you. I would like to look at women and power and male entitlements to power. We are going to touch on the concepts of patriarchy, sexism, and misogyny, and hopefully um, how to differentiate between them. In the first part, um, I'm going to draw on information from a book that Elder Tess has recommended in the media broadcast. It's called Women and Power by Mary Beard. Some of you might have read it. Um, and another book I'm going to use is entitled How Male Privilege Hurts Women by Kate Mann. And that's actually the book I will base most of my presentation on. I took uh, one chapter of the book, which is about, it focuses on the, on the male entitlement to power. And that's where I want to focus on today. Um, so about, maybe a little bit about the author. Kate Mann is an associate professor of philosophy at Cornell University in New York. Herself, she's an um, Australian but she's been living in, in the US for a long time. And um, in 2019, she was named one of the world's top 10 thinkers by Prospect Magazine. You might also have heard of her previous book with the title Down Girl, which has uh, won several awards. And one of the media broadcast articles that were shared, it was about incels, also quoted from one of her books. I'm not sure if, if it was Down Girl or Entitled. Um, okay. So Entitled looks at eight different areas of life where our society deems men entitled to certain privileges. Um, and entitlement is when you have the right to claim something. People high in entitlement believe that they should get what they want because of who they are. In this case, because they are male. And synonyms for entitled would be privileged, authorized, chartered, eligible, or empowered. So in this case, um, we're looking at how society, yeah, gives men certain privileges um, or deems them entitled to these privileges. I'm going to write down a list of these entitlements. In every chapter, um, the author takes up one example and then she turns, she takes real life cases and turns them into um, a case study of misogyny so that you can really understand what that, what that looks like in practice. But I'm, I'm not only going to, let's um, just list them briefly. First entitlement is the entitlement to admiration. We have the entitlement to sex, to consent, that is, Consent to sex, medical care, bodily control, domestic labor, Knowledge and power.
and there is a lot to say about um, about every one of them, but um, it really wouldn't do them justice if we just briefly touched on all of them. So I decided to just focus on power today because probably the most, in a patriarchal society, the most obvious privilege is probably power because a male, a male a society that is um, structured as in a patriarchal way um, is governed by um, men and follows a, a male hierarchy. So that the leadership positions are uh, occupied by, by men. So we will, um, we will see that the idea that men are the ones that should be in positions of power, whether that's in a company, whether that's in politics or government is still deeply rooted in our society today. And um, we are going to go back in history with Mary Beard to find out where that comes from. And later we want to come to the present and we'll look into some scientific research. Um, yeah, that looks into the, the negative bias women face when they, when they pursue roles that have traditionally been regarded as male coded. And we also want to connect the findings from these studies to, um, to real life cases of female leaders we all know. So the studies that we're going to look at, um, they will show us, I hope that we are going to take away from that, that um, you know, they, they show us how we think as a society. We think it's natural for men to hold positions of power and unnatural for women to do so because we have been trained like this uh, for six, for 6,000 years. So um, that brings me to our definition of sexism that we have been using in the movement for a while now. Sexism is the deepest, the worst, the oldest and the most fundamental form of oppression. Why do we say that? We are, we have, a, we have a line that starts in Eden. We know that God created Adam and Eve as equals. They were to equally benefit and protect each other. But after sin, God pronounced a curse on them, and that was the curse of sexism. We have been strong on the point that a curse is a prophecy of negative consequences. It's not that God wanted to punish them by introducing sexism. It's not something that he invented because, or yeah, that he invented or even desired to introduce into the world, but what happened is that God foresaw the negative consequences that the behavior of um, humanity would have on the generations after them. So he foresaw that women would be subordinate to men. And that's also what we read in Genesis 3, 16, where it says, men shall rule over you. So that's not something God wanted this way but it was the consequences, the negative consequences he foretold. So we mark sexism all the way at the beginning um, of this earth's history. When it was introduced, humanity invented patriarchy as um, as a solution because they had a problem. Wandering Eves, after all, it was the woman, she left the side of, the, of her husband 
and had fallen into sin, or that's, that's how they saw where they saw the problem. And so, th so they invented a system that would keep her in her place. I want us to see that with this first curse, um, the oppression was limited to women. But we can see that from this first form, patriarchy, um, it finally also led to the oppression and enslavement of men too. And that's in the third curse that brought about slavery. Um, here it's limited to women, but it developed over time into other forms of, of oppression. We also have the curse on pain. That is about um, freedom of freedom, freedom of worship, or re religious freedom, or let's say religious intolerance. The curse. So whether it's um, oppression because of race, because of nationality, ethnicity, um, or religion, it all stems from one and the oldest form of oppression, which is sexism. Um, they all have developed because of that. And we know that God works to restore the damage these curses have done over the course of history. Um, in 1863, we, re we, mark we marked the restoration of the curse of slavery when slaves were free in, in Ellen White's time. Then we also have 1888, where religious freedom, religious um, freedom of conscience um, was restored. And we are still waiting for that um, foundational one to be restored in our time. So that's why we say sexism is the most fundamental form of oppression. And it takes God the longest to restore its damage. And yeah, it's still alive, very much alive today. God wants to root, he wants to root out patriarchy. And he wants us to be on the same page in this work. And we, so we need to become more sharp and sensitized to what patriarchy, misogyny, and sexism look like in our culture. First of all, where, where they come from and then what they have morphed into um, and, and where they still hide in our culture today. Because um, we can only fight, um, we can only fight them when we, when we know what we are up against. Let's... Um, Let's make a step, step back in history. So this is uh, Women and Power by Mary Beard. It has been called a feminist classic by other sources like The Observer. Mary Beard is an, an English scholar of ancient Rome and she has been covered frequently in the media and is known for sometimes controversial public statements. That has led her to being described as Britain's best known classicist. So she's an expert in ancient Greek and Roman literature, ranging from roughly um, 1000 BC to 680. In Women and Power, Mary Beard says that women in the West um, have a lot to celebrate when it comes to victories for women's rights. But she also says that the mechanisms that silence women are very deeply embedded in Western culture. 
Still, women are not taken seriously and sometimes quite literally excluded from the centers of power. And she says that um, we need to look to the history of the ancient Greeks and Romans to find out why or, yeah. Um, Yeah, where that where where that comes from? She says, and actually, she's she's there saying, or that's that aligns with what we have been saying as a movement for a while now, that sexism is paganism, and um, our Western culture has had thousands of years of practice in it. So approximately, we start now, um, approximately eight hundred years before. Christ was born, there was a Greek poet called Homer. Some of you might have heard at least the name. Um, his works are today regarded as foundational in Greek literature. One of his works was um, the Odyssey. I'm going to I'm sure you have read or heard his name somewhere before. Um, so this story, the Odyssey, is about um, Odysseus. He was a Greek king. And he was, the story goes that he was off fighting in the Trojan War, while his wife, Penelope, And his son, Telemachus, were back home, waiting for him to come back. Um, the Trojan War lasted for 10 years. And after it ended, it took, um, it took Odyssey another 10 years to journey home again. And so people back in Greece, they actually thought that he had long died. He was assumed dead. And the story um, then goes that, um, so while, he, while, while Odyssey was gone, there were a lot of admirers that um, wanted to marry Penelope. And her and she and her son had to, yeah, to deal with them, to fight off all these admirers. So one day, one day when um, many of those admirers had gathered in their in the hall of their palace a poet was entertaining them he was singing something to them ironically he sings about the difficulty greek heroes face in reaching home and penelope comes down into the hall from her room and she hears that and she's not amused about it and tells asks this singer or this poet in front of everyone to sing something else um, and that's when her son, Telemachus, intervenes. We have to be aware, he, he just turned an adult. Um, and he, being so young, intervenes and tells his mother to basically shut her mouth. Um, and the reason he gives for that is that speech is a man's business and that he has the power in this household. Public speaking was a part of becoming a man. So um, it was not just something women didn't do. It was regarded as an exclusive practice and skill that defined masculinity. Um, there's a Roman slogan that summarizes what um, an elite male citizen is. Um, it, it's called, it's called Vir Bonus Descendi Peritus. Um, I'm going to write that down. Vir Bonus Bonus. So that means good man.
And that means, um, the whole phrase means a good man skilled in speaking. So a grown-up man um, was it, it was considered part of growing up, manning up um, that you were to become a good speaker. Let me read um, the first quote. You should have it uh, in your document. There is something faintly ridiculous about this wet behind the ears lad shutting up the savvy middle-aged Penelope. But it is a nice demonstration that right where written evidence from, for Western culture starts, women's voices are not being heard in the public sphere. More than that, as Homer has it, an integral part of growing up as a man is learning to take control of public utterance and to silence the female of the species. So what we take from this quote is this story is one of the first written evidences for Western culture. That's where um, the records for Western cultures, culture starts. And we see in this story that women are not being heard in the public sphere. So women are not to speak in public. It's the business of a man. We see that this young fellow, Telemachus, who just left adolescence, um, silences his own mother in public. And it is seen as something that is good. And um, it ought to be that way. So for those of you who might not know Homer or Odyssey, myself included, because I didn't really, I, I had to look it up. I was not familiar. I can't remember having read it or so. So you, yeah, we might think, um, ah, that's just an old story. Who would even bother about it? But I want to read you something from Wikipedia. That's the second quote on your document. The Odyssey is regarded as one of the most significant works of the Western canon. The Western canon is the body of high culture literature, music, philosophy, and works of art that are highly valued in the West. Works that have achieved the status of classics. The first English translation of the Odyssey was in the 16th century. Adaptations and reimaginings continue to be produced across a wide variety of media. In 2018, when BBC Culture polled experts about the world, around the world to find literature's most enduring narrative, the Odyssey topped the list. So this is to show the significance of this work and the impact it had on shaping our culture. But um, let's go back to, back to the book. Mary Beard then goes on to show us that not only speaking of the speaking itself, like when women spoke in public, not only that was a problem, but also how um, they spoke. Roman orators, so public speakers, believed that the low-pitched male voice was a symbol for courage, while the high-pitched female voice expressed cowardice. And other classical writers insisted that the tone and timbre of women's speech always threatened to subvert not just the voice of the male orator, but also the social and political stability, the health of the whole state. Oh, that was um, quote number three on your, 
on your document. So not only literature, but there was also Roman or orators and they, yeah, they plainly said um, a woman's voice is not to be heard in pub public. This is dangerous for the stability of, the, of a nation. It's uh, not good. And it was generally regarded as, yeah, women in power were regarded as a joke. Um, it was made fun of. And um, there are also other records where um, writers described as the, the, the incredible situation when a woman comes to power, the chaos that would cause. It was, it was really um, yeah, dramatized and um, made fun of. Fam other famous novelists from the late 19th century thought that women's voices would pollute the language until it sounded like the mooing of cows or a donkey's bray. And still today, it's, it's far more often said about women that they squeak, they whine, they squawk, screech, cackle, or produce other non-human sounds. Or that their voices are just unpleasant to listen to. That was, for, for example, that was the case with Hillary Clinton. Um, she was often criticized for her voice. I'm quoting here. Um, she was said to, she shouts, there is something unrelaxed about the way she is communicating. Political observers have called her voice loud, flat, harassing to the ear. They have said um, she has a decidedly grating pitch and a punishing tone and called her shrill. And that's next to her competitor, Bernie Sanders who is known for shouting in his speeches, but never really receives um, criticism like that. Another example is Jacinda Ardern. Um, you, I have to say former New Zealand prime minister because she stepped down this week. Um, but after the, the terrorist attacks in Christchurch, she held an impressive speech that was really, she was really praised for it actually in, in general um, around the world. But there were also other voices um, that, yes, they always take the opportunity to yeah, level an attack. Let's, let's just um, read it. So in, in, this, in this speech to the victims of, the terrorist attack, she promised not to say the name of the perpetrator. Um, and after her speech, someone reacted uh, on Twitter to, to that statement. It was an, an Australian TV presenter. He tweeted, and that's quote number four in the document, thank heavens, New Zealand prime minister said she will never mention the name of the terrorist. How grating is her accent? So do we see what, what is happening when people are focusing on superficial things like a woman's voice, the tone of it? Um, they are, with that they are totally distracting from what, is, what she's actually saying. The message or the content behind the speech gets completely lost. And that's an old, just an old trick to avoid listening or avoid having to, to go deeper into what was actually said. So the female voices, um, the female voice, I have to say, served as a tool to continually exclude women from public speaking and therefore often, um, or yeah, continually excluding them from powerful position. I want to read quote number five from the document. The classical traditions 
have provided us with a powerful template for thinking about public speech and for deciding what counts as good oratory or bad, persuasive or not, and whose speech is to be given space to be heard. And gender is obviously an important part of that mix. Um, I highlighted the word template there because I think, yeah, that's, that's the problem. The, our template by culture for public speech is male. And consequently, the criteria for what counts as good speech or, or a nice voice to listen to are also male. The criteria for what constitutes authority are male. And that makes it extraordinarily hard for women to be heard, even today after three waves of feminism, or you could argue how many waves there were. But even though a lot of developments in favor of women's rights have taken place, um, we still see the effects of this kind of culture that is so in embedded um, even today. We stick to we stick to our we stick to that male template, and haven't learned to broaden um, our perception of what what constitutes authority. We have to learn that authority is not something that men or anyone is born with, but that it has been culturally assigned. To to them we it's not something women can't have it's that we deny them it's something we deny them based on our cultural programming um, i'd like us to consider the impact that has on women Because that social programming that also has an effect on them, of course. It's not only that we, as a society, we tend not to be able to imagine women in powerful positions. It's also that women themselves, um, they lack the role models, they lack the, the confidence. And I want to share from an article that I've read um, about this. So as, I, as I've already said, um, officially, there has been a lot of development in favor of women's rights. So women today have the same rights and opportunities as men, in theory. And there are, there are a lot of women who stand up and make use of that. But there are many who, also many who don't, because they, they don't want to, they, they are scared, they feel incompetent, they think they have nothing valuable to share. And so in, intellectually, they might know that they are empowered to stand up, to let their voice be heard. Um, but practically, they don't, often don't feel capable to do so. So the forces that hold women in their place are bigger than just the intellectual knowledge of empowerment. Um, so what I, what I want to share now is based on a Dutch article. <laughs> I've tried to translate it in, in Deeple um, to, to English, but <laughs> it didn't really turn out well. So I, I decided to... Um, Try to summarize it in, in my own words. The article is written by a, a young woman who is the editor of a well-known Dutch talk show. Um, the article has been printed in a renowned uh, Dutch newspaper. So she tells us of her, her dilemma that she's often in when um, they are discussing in their editorial meetings, they're discussing their program and who they're going to invite. Often the problem is that they don't have enough women 
women participating in talk shows, um, that their tables are often um, filled with old white men, or, yeah, to make it a, a label. <laughs> but um, that's how she tells uh, the story. So she always thought, before she worked there, she always thought the solution to that problem, that women are just underrepresented um, in, on TV, in the media, um, would be that someone fights for more diversities. There, there should be a young woman editor like herself that would fight for more diversity. But she says that she was wrong there. And she tells about the many times she received text messages, emails, phone calls by other by men who basically wanted to invite themselves to her talk show. Um, one has wrote a book. The other one is an expert on that. And um, the other one knows that the effects of climate change on fruit flies. <laughs> Another one has to say something about the recent news about childcare. So there's always um, a man that would invite himself to her show, say, hey, would, would that be interesting? Let me know, I could come, I could speak on that. Um, so they are keen on telling their stories and they're good talkers. But then uh, when she reaches out to women, she actually wants to have a woman that is an expert in a certain area certain field, then she tends to get one and the same answer, and uh, no. <laughs> if either the woman is terrified to be on a show, I don't know enough, um, or they, they always know a colleague, a male colleague that um, would be better suited or something like that. Um, so basically she, yeah. She would like to invite a woman, but she always ends up with, with a man. Um, let me read one bit. I don't think that's in your notes, but I think. So her, her point is not to say it's the women's fault that they don't want to be invited but rather she points to all the criticism women face about appearance, their voice, their clothes, their hairstyle, once they have been on a show um, that has been broadcasted. Often they face um, a lot of criticism on social media, um, but also other media. And that scares many women. No wonder that they are terrified. That's the point she makes. She don't, does, doesn't want to blame the women. Um, for that. She says, don't get me wrong. The woman we as a talk show, as talk show editors preferred to have has more experience than the man who eventually joins the show. This phenomenon is not new. Several studies have shown that women systematically underestimate themselves, whereas men are more likely to consider themselves too knowledgeable. In addition, men are more likely to be seen as brilliant, making it harder for women to prove themselves competent at the talk show table. And that, of course, is also based on these cultural patterns we have become used to, yeah, that have been 6,000 years in the making. Um, Um, is it correct that we've been going for about 45 minutes now? Uh, yes, you have, uh, yes, you have about half, half an hour. Oh, okay. You can use as much time as you need. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I was just thinking maybe it's a good, um, maybe it's a good place to actually have a break and then continue with some of the studies that I want to share. Let me see.
Mm. Yeah, let's let's do a short recap. Um, so we have reminded ourselves of our line from Eden to Eden, or better, I should say the chiasm that we um, that shows us that sexism was introduced with the very first sin as a curse, as a uh, negative prophecy of the consequences that came into the world by, um, by sin and how it developed into other forms of oppression um, and how it takes God 6,000 years to root these damages out that we're still in the process of um, the last one being restored. So that's why we say sexism is the deepest, the oldest, the worst, and the most fundamental form of oppression. And today, in our time, we are still, um, we are still battling against, um, against the damage it has done um, in our culture. We have said that there have been a lot of developments in favor um, of women, that the situation for women has progressively improved. Um, we can see in the time of Moses, let me, in the time of Moses, um, Ancient Israel. And modern Israel. So the time of Moses is a time when yeah, you you know you read about patriarchs and prophets and no female voices are heard actually um also the bible mostly mentions um men you don't read much of the stories of of women and you we also know that it was a time when women didn't actually have a direct covenant with god the only way to, for them to have a covenant with God was um, through their husbands, <clears throat> because, of course, circumcision was only restricted to men. So when you come to Christ's time, or the end of ancient Israel, um, we see that there have been certain, there were certain changes. Women now enter into a covenant themselves by baptism. Um, but still you have, they're not supposed to speak at church, for example. We have Paul um, tells us that women are to submit to their husbands. Then in Ellen White, White's time or the time of human rights, there's another step forward. We know that Ellen White lifted women up into more important roles, um, that they were to have more responsibility, but we also know they should submit. Um, Ellen White also writes that in her, in her writings. And then when we come to the end of ancient Israel, uh, modern Israel, or the history of the 144,000, um, Ipsos 2016, we marked the, the presidential election in the US, um, where we had a woman candidate and a male candidate. We know prophetically that Trump and Hillary Clinton stood for two different streams of information and that Hillary Clinton represented the good stream. And so that she was prophetically the right choice as president. 
And we know that um, if a woman can be president externally, so if externally we believe a woman can lead the world, lead a nation, then um, we also apply that internally as a movement and say, hey, women can also have leadership position and they should have leadership positions in the church. So that's where our movement makes another step forward compared to the time of Ellen in also um, ordinating women and preaching equality. <clears throat> so that's where how we see with our Eden to Eden line very um, basic. I didn't go into much detail, but we see that there has been a progression of um, this restoration, progressive restoration of equality. Um, and in our time, then we are we are um, we are supposed to restore patriarchy or root out uproot um, the patriarchal system. And we've gone back into history. Mary Beard has given us a few examples of cultural works, or yeah, I should say ancient literature that has shaped um, our Western culture. Um, that, so that um, still today we have the influences of those, this mindset, um, it still lives in our, in our culture today. And those patterns, these learned, this cultural programming is very difficult to undo. And sometimes it's even, it's even unconscious. That's what we are going to go into in the second presentation. We are going to look at scientific research that shows um, that there's negative bias against women who pursue leadership roles um, or jobs that would be traditionally considered a man's job or that are highly, um, the, or if, if it's about the highest positions of power, like being speaker of the house or president of the United States, that this has, um, yeah, that we are very much still unconsciously, we expect the people who want to have these jobs to fulfill certain um, characteristics. But let's, um, let's close with a prayer. Let's close um, the first presentation and we're going to continue after the break. If you kneel with me, we'll, we'll close in prayer. Dear God, I thank you for the time we can spend together as a movement. Thank you that it's possible for us to meet, even though we are on different ends of the, of the earth. And we ask you to bless our Sabbath hours, that we may be able to take with us these things that we have heard, that they may settle in our minds, in our hearts. Continue to guide us on this day and bless us when we come back together after the break. We thank you for your movement. Thank you for how you lead your movement, how, where you have brought us as a movement. And that we are, yeah, that you give us this information that will, that transforms our character. That's my prayer for, for every one of us. In Jesus' name. Amen.